Good morning. Good morning. We are uh, enjoying the snow. Family and I got out a little bit last night to play it in uh, while we try to clear the parking lot. And had snow plows come last evening. They plowed and getting in early this morning after the snow had finished. And still, um, still a little bit more snow coming down. So lots of lots of snow, lots of uh, fun stuff with that. Um, but we are we are thankful to be in the house of the Lord and in uh, joy His presence, um, even if it is just myself down here. But God is so so good to us, and um, we're uh, thankful. Thankful for technology to be able to still connect with our people. Um, right now, we're looking forward to um, still having service at this time uh, tonight. Um, we'll see how things go. When I came in, snow was starting to fall again. And so, um, just say good morning to everybody. And um, so, for this morning, we're going to look at the scriptures out of Matthew chapter 7. Um, we're preaching through Ezra when we have our uh, regular scheduled Sunday morning services. But this morning, just for a devotional thought, um, I wanted to look at Matthew chapter 7. I've already wrote it down here on the board for us. But Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14 says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, um, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Um, just real quick, I already noticed something that I did. Um, let me go ahead and straighten that back out. But this is one of my, uh, my favorite texts to go to. Um, when dealing with what is happening in our world today. Um, we, we, we have a world um, where there's decreasing commitment to the church, but not really just to the church. It's seen in, in all arenas of life, um, whether it's companies or whatever. There they have to uh, give you loyalty cards uh, to have incentives to bring you back. But I think part of the problem with that is that we have, we have so many options. And uh, with so many options, we, we, we tailor things for ourselves. That's, that's what technology has done. And, and with so much uh, specific areas of different things, um, our phones. If um, you have two identical phones with the technology, um, find out in about six months that there's a new phone with just slightly newer upgrades than yours. But the difference between one phone and another phone is the person can uh, personalize it. Um, so a lot of options, a lot of options, and the church has not escaped that. Um, people's uh, way of looking at life does not escape that. Um, but the reality is when we come down to a very, very uh, ground level understanding of life, is it doesn't operate with options. And that's what Jesus is doing in this uh, passage of Scripture that we read from. Um, and it's, in fact, nestled um, here in the seventh chapter at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is giving a discourse, a uh, conversation with the disciples and the multitudes that were gathered there of what it's going to look like to be a kingdom citizen. Um, he is the side, he is, he is the king of this new kingdom. And, and he comes down to what I basically call um, the altar call part of the sermon. Uh, he, he's, he's talked about the law. He's talked about... Um, uh, different vices that the Pharisees looked at, the ancients looked at, but yet he, he talks about going another step with them. He talks about pure religion, not, not being a hypocrite when it comes to our prayers and our fasting and our giving. And he talks about worry, um, and this is all related to what it means to be in the kingdom of Christ. However, he brings it down to some very, very basic understanding. He's the first, this is the first one, uh, the straight and the wide gates. Um, two options, no middle ground. Then he goes to another one and talks about false prophets, um, and or good prophets, um, you're, you're either or, you're, you're not an in-between, you're either a good tree bearing good fruit or a uh, bad tree, a wicked tree bearing uh, bitter fruits. Um, you're not in-between, a good tree doesn't produce wicked fruits, and a wicked tree doesn't produce good fruits. And then the very last um, illustration that he gives is of a sand and rock foundation for uh, building our lives on. Um, a person who hears the word of God and does them is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. Um, and a foolish person is like those that hear the word of God and don't do them, could have the same exact blueprints, do everything else the same as far as conducting their life, but if they don't do the word of God, they're like a foolish person who builds their house on the sand, on the sand and when the waves come, um, they wash it out, they beat it down. And so we, we, we come to a place where we have to make a decision. And what is that decision that he begins with? Well, the poet says um, that two roads diverged in the yellow wood. And he knew that he could not uh, go through uh, both of them because he would never return to this spot. It was a journey he was going to take. So he looks at both of them, sizes them up in the poem, and he looks at one that has had a lot of wear. It's, it, it, people have often chose it the most. And then the other path is wanting wear. Um, it's overgrown, and it comes out to the end of it, and he says that he, that he took the tro a road less traveled by, and that one decision has made all the difference. And that's what Jesus is talking about here as well. There's two paths of life, no middle ground. You either follow after the Lord, or you don't follow after the Lord. And so we've got to... Uh, make that decision in our heart. We've got to come to uh, that Joshua moment as he led the people across into the Canaan land, the promised land. 
And he stands above them and says, I choose you this day whom you will serve. Either serve the gods on the other side of the river that you served before, or serve the one true family, uh, the one true, true, true Lord. But as for me and my house, my family, we will serve the Lord. We've got to make that decision for ourselves personally. We've got to make that for our families. We've got to make that for our churches. We've got to make that for our businesses, for our government. Um, there is no, no in between. Um, one phrase I heard about being indecisive or trying to be on both sides is um, <clears throat> when you straddle the fence, you become a target for both sides. You're, you're, you're neither, uh, neither one of them, and you're, you're, you're going to fall down on one side or the other. And more than likely, when it comes to our um, relationship with God, if we're trying the fence, we're going to fall on the opposite side that God is. We're going to be on the wrong side of things. And so we've got to look at this. Now, when Jesus is talking here, I want to put this up on the board so if you're following with me, you can see it here. Um, he starts here and says, Enter ye in at the straight. Um, one thing I want to point out is this word, ye. Um, this is a message for everyone. This is one of the powerful things about the uh, King James translation in that um, it has a more exact nature to it. Um, than what we do in just one generation removed in the English language. And so when you have ye and you have thee, you know whether it's talking to one person or whether it's talking to a group. You really can't do that um, unless you're from southern Ohio and you say you all uh, or y'all, um, something like that. But ye is speaking to a plurality, a group of people, whereas thee speaks to a singular person. We have enter ye. And so we have a command. You all, everybody under the sound of Jesus' voice that's hearing this message is being challenged to follow him. And that message goes out to us even today. We are all being challenged to follow his directions, to follow his guidance. And that's what we have here. We are to enter into this. We are to, to fully move into it. Um, think, think of um, your marriage, or if, you, if you're not married, um, think back to um, at a time in your life with that, or as another example. Um, you, you, you said your I do's, right? You made, you made your decision, and then it comes to that time when you get home from the honeymoon and you're getting ready to, to go across the threshold. The tradition was that the husband carried the, his new bride into the house um, she, he carried her over the threshold, and, and we, we do that um, as kind of like a celebration home. It's, it's a whole lot of things. But the reality is a lot of people make a decision to follow Christ, but they don't fully enter into him. Um, they stand there at the threshold, and they just look around and say, oh, this is nice. This is nice. Um, yeah, we're falling in. There's this moment of, yeah, we're, we're bringing Jesus home. We're, we're, we're bringing him into our entire life. So enter fully into this. Don't just stand at the threshold of salvation. Don't just stand at the threshold of, of life with Christ. Walk fully in him. And then going on here, this is where I had to make a correction. Even I had to catch myself on this. Um, he says, enter ye in at the straight gate. Enter ye in at the straight gate. Well, the correction I had to make in so many things is um, I put, I put um, the GH in straight and um, that's, that's how a lot of people think life with Christ is going to be. Um, that when you come to him, everything becomes okie, uh, okie dory, you know, uh, no problems, everything's absolutely perfect and we don't make mistakes and that um, there's no, no more trials and that's part from the truth it's not a straight path rather um, life even with christ is still sometimes um, not always on the easiest path there's bends and uh, crooks along this life journey with the lord rather than that word straight um, it, 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 it's more of a technical term with with um with the layout of the land a straight gate um, you might be out on a trail and and you find this um, path. You, you, you see it. But the problem is you've had maybe two trees fall down over the path and, and you have to crawl through that. That would be a straight. Um, or, or think of looking at a map and you, and, and you see like the Bering Strait or um, these different areas in waterways called a straight. And that's where two uh, where you have a large body of water on one side and on the other side but you have land coming in um, and there is a very narrow access. That's what it means by a straight gate. This gate is not a wide gate as it is proposed right here as the opposite. Rather, it's a, it's a gate that is hidden. Um, you have to be searching. You have to have your attention drawn to it. And, and that's a thing. God, God uh, no one comes to the Father except he is drawn by, by the Father. And, and so, so he wakens us to our, to our, to our need of him, and, and he draws us to him. And so, so it is something that so many people pass by. And, and, and that is kind of what the conversation is here, is that it, 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 Christ is not eye-catching. He, he's not fancy. He's not entertainment. And so, so a lot of people, because he's none of those things, he's not this, this therapeutic counselor that, that is simply there to take away our problems because life is still difficult, and he does walk us through those things, people miss him and, and passing by because they don't know all that he has to offer on the other side of the gate. But it's a straight gate. It's, it's, it, it's hard to get through. Um, Jesus used the words that um, it would be easier um, for a camel to get through the eye of the needle than uh, for a rich man to enter into heaven. And uh, regardless of whether there's arguments of whether there was an actual um, eye of the needle in the walls of the city that they would try to sneak people in, um, that's, not, that's not really here or there. Um, but even if Jesus is speaking metaphor, speaking of a literal needle and the eye threading in between it, um, 
if it's easier for a camel to even just go through that than it is for a rich man. He's talking about the straight gate, how, how it is difficult for some people to lay down uh, their burdens, how it's difficult for some people to, to lay down their issues in life and give them over to God and simply trust him to supply their need. That's the big thing, is when you're when you're out walking trails and you're hiking, you probably have a backpack on, you've got, you've got your supplies if you're planning on this being a long trip, and you got there, and, and Christ is saying, you're going to take a trip with me, we're going to go hiking in life, we're going, we're going to do this adventure in life together, but to do that, we've got to start at this point, and you have to trust me by laying down everything and giving it all to me, and trust me as your guide, that when you have a need, we'll take care of that need. And so, we go through the straight gate. Well, Let's begin to look at what he says is the opposite. He focuses on that. He introduces that there's a straight gate. And that is something that is, it, it can be hard for people to accept and go through. But look at the opposite. He says, For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that will lead you to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. And so he's talking about, first off, why is the gate? <clears throat> what is he talking about here? Well, the reality is we all enter into this gate. We're born into it. Romans 3.23 tells us, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We were shaped in our iniquity. We were born into sin. We all have this rebellious nature against God. We're not born as clean slates. We're born um, broken and away from God and except by the grace of God that he gives us that pull and begins to turn our heart toward him. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot do anything on our own. There is no works that we can do to bring salvation. Salvation is simply the gift of God. And so wide is the gate. But we come to that moment where we begin to make choices for ourselves, and we are held responsible for those things. And, and we continually make that choice to enter into this wide gate, to make this our lifestyle, to make this our home. And it extends into a broad path. And so he says, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way. Well, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, talks about how this is the course of the world. Proverbs 14 and 12 says, There is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That's Proverbs 14 12. This is just life. This is life without Christ. It's broad. It's a wide spectrum. It's, there's people of all walks of life. Um, it, it's, it's something that, that people get into and, and, and it accommodates every lifestyle. Um, people, people calling wrong good and good wrong. People confused about who they are, their identity, they're confused about morality, they're confused about what truth is and if truth is absolute or whether it is relative, it is a broad path and, and everything in every lifestyle that exalts itself against God is accepted. But in the end, it leads to destruction. What is this destruction? Well, that is simply a life separated from God and living and dwelling in a lake of fire in hell. Matthew 8, 12 says that this is a place, this destruction is full of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 10, 18 talks about how this is spiritual and physical destruction, chaos and, 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 and wrath against our, us. Matthew 13, 42 and, and, and verse 50 talks about how this is like fiery furnaces. This is, this is, this is um, the wrath of God kindled against us. The book of Mark talks about um, how this is a place, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry look at Matthew still, um, chapter 22, um, verse 13, talks about how this is a place of outer darkness. Um, our family went last year in the summer down at down the Carter Caves, and we've done this several times. They, they love to take you down into the caves, and they talk about how there are only um, two places um, where there is pitch black. One is in the cave, and one is in the deep trenches of the oceans, where there is no light, and they turn the lights off. And they try to demonstrate uh, what outer darkness or pitch blackness looks like. But there's another place of outer darkness where there is no light, and that is in hell. And then, then Mark, Mark 9, verses 48 through 49, talks about how it's a place of unquenchable fire. It is a place where you burn and burn and burn, and, and it never goes out. And then Luke talks about, um, in verse 16, uh, verses 16, 23 through 24, about, about the rich man, how um, he died, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. It's a place of, of constant torments. I, I, I remember one of my first sermons, um, I preached on hell, and, and, it, and it talked about, um, in that sermon, of, of not only the physical torments, but the mental torments. He, that, that rich man had mental torments of, of his family coming there. He was worried about that. He, he wanted to prevent that, and he was left with this understanding that, that um, his testimony was leading them to um, the same torment place that he is in. And so, so it's a place of destruction. 
Now, Jesus spoke about hell more than any other person in the New Testament. And we find it throughout the New Testament. There are, um, there are 260 uh, chapters in the New Testament and 54 verses, uh, 54 references to hell sprinkled throughout that. It means about every four chapters, you can find something about hell. Think of it like this. We're on a journey. You're walking on the broad path. You're in your sin. You're caught up in it. You're from, from the beginning of this path to the end of this path. Let's say it's 260 miles. One for every chapter. There are warning signs. Bridge out. Um, this path leads to destruction. That would be like having a warning sign for 260 miles every four miles. Every four miles for 260 miles, you would have a warning in front of you. Turn around. Don't go this way. This is a path that leads to destruction. The, the bridge is out. The, the, it's been broken down because of sin, and it is going to lead you over a cliff into the very pits of hell. That's what Jesus is doing here. He is warning people there is two ways you can go, a path of destruction or a path of life. Enter the other one. Enter the straight gate. Enter the path that will lead you away. But the reality is many there be which go in thereat. Not only are they born into it, not only do we have this nature that... Um, leads us towards it, and uh, we willfully choose it because of those things. We find that people love their sin, and this is what, what the book of Romans chapters 1 and 2 talks about, is that there are people that not only do these sinful things, but they encourage others to do them. They're, they're, uh, Romans chapter 3 talks about how, how there is none that seek to do good, all seek blood, all seek revenge, all seek wrath, all seek these sinful things. But Jesus offers us hope. Jesus offers a, a path the Bible tells us in, 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 in the book of, of Hebrews that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. Some have translated that, and I, and I like this word, not necessarily the translation, but uh, the, other, the whole translation, but the word um, that, they, that, they, that they bring it to, um, being uh, he's the trailblazer. We didn't have access to God before Christ because we were all caught up in sin. But Christ came perfect, sinless. And he died for us, resurrected for us, and ascended to the Father's right hand. And by doing that, he blazed a trail so that we can have access to the Father, that we can go by him. Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He says, if you go any other way, it's still part of the broad path, and it will lead to destruction. But I have an offbeat path. I have and come, come to this trail that I've created, that I've made for you. It's the only one that will lead you to the Father. And so he says, come through me enter into the way. It's interesting. Because of teachings like this, uh, talking about the way, um, Jesus calling himself the way, before before they were called Christians at Antioch, um, um, extra-biblical records say that the name that people used to refer to Christians and Christians refer to themselves was they were the people of the way. And we have, we have much in Scripture to um, even bring us to that understanding. But again, look at what he says here, that the way, uh, enter in at the straight gate. So we know it's a straight gate. And... Um, um, I, I did it even even down here. Like I said, it's so easy to get caught up in that. It's not a word that we use very often. Um, so we have, because straight is the gate, he reminds us again. He calls us back to this. He reminds us about the straight gate. It's a narrow gate. It's a narrow entry. And we see in Scripture that this is pointed out over and over again. In John chapter 10, verse, verse, um, verse 9, he talks about, it says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. He's a narrow door. And it's Jesus. Luke chapter chapter 13, verse 24, says, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able to. So it's something that you have to lay down your life for Christ. You have to give yourself over to him, and people won't do that. And then he goes on also in chapter 13, verse 33, and says, So likewise, Whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. We have to give up self. We have to give up our, our, our ambitions and, and, and our, our way of living and take up Christ. We have to lay down self, deny self, take up his cross and follow after him to be his disciples. And then he goes on and says, and narrow is the way. One thing that we learn is that when you become a Christian, things don't get easier. In fact, persecution and troubles may increase because the world and, and the demonic forces uh, the devil begin to oppress us, begin to come against us. And so, so we find that, that the way is very narrow, and, and it's easy to, to, to slip off of that and, and to, as use Paul's word, to, to um, make shipwreck of the faith or, or to become cast away ourselves if we don't seek to live our life according to his. But Jesus is that way. We have to live after him. 
and what does he talk about that way, the life of Christ? Well, John 14, 6, he says again, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And so we've got to seek after him. And what does it lead us to? It leads to life. It leads us to life. Isaiah chapter 35, verses 8 and 9. I'll go ahead and bring it out here. I'm running out of space. Isaiah chapter 39, or 35, verses 8 and 9. It says, And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. That sounds like a straight and narrow way. Many won't go into it. Fools will pass by it. But what does it say here? It says, No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up on go up thereon. It shall not be found there. But the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Wow, what a thing. There's not going to be anything that wants us to cause us trouble. When we get to the end of this life and into the next, we know that our adversary, the devil, will be completely out of the picture. He won't be able to tread on that new heaven and new earth. The tempter will have been cast down. And then he goes on to talk about how our joy and our and our peace will be fulfilled. It will be, will be so astounding and, and that sorrow and sighing, mourning, grieving will be cast away. It will run away at the sight of us. I'm looking forward to that way that leads unto life. Uh, the old song, it's a highway to heaven. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. I'm trying my best to walk on it. And I know it says, and it says, uh, few there be that find it. Um, many are called, but few, but few are chosen. And some people will try to say, well, that's that's because God um, chooses. No, I'm, I, I, I've taught a lot of classes. And when I ask people a question or for participation, I ask the entire class. But only a few raise their hands, and so only a few are chosen then. It's, it's, it's one of those things uh, where, where people just don't want it. I, I, I've talked with preachers and different things. Of, um, they, they get discouraged of, of, a, of a lack of souls converted in their ministry, and, and some have changed to saying, well, that's just God's choice that those people aren't saved. No, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to everlasting life. That's why he tarries to give people that opportunity to cry out and receive him as Lord. The problem is that people just don't want it. People, people have sin turned in their life, and it pulls them away from God. And so they need to hear the preaching of his word. And if you're listening and you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, again, two choices stand before you. You can either follow after God or you can follow after the world. To follow after the world is to follow a path that leads to destruction. Not only at the end of life, but you will find guilt in your life. You will, you will, you will find yourself not satisfied, empty, a vacuum inside, an emptiness that cannot be filled. But if you follow after God, you will find that it is a path that leads to everlasting life. But in the here and now, it also leads to contentment. It leads to joy. It leads to peace. And if you start on it, if you're young and you start on it now, it is something that will lead you away from having guilt later on in life. It's something that will lead you away from, from the bitterness of going out and, and sowing your wild oats and, and finding that you have to uh, later harvest from that. He'll keep you from a life of pain in that sense. Yes, there'll be trials, but he's going to walk with you. He's going to give you his Holy Spirit to strengthen you and guide you along this path. So make that choice today. Just like Joshua, my house, as, as long as it's me, as long as it's my house, we'll serve the Lord. Name him as your king. Name him as the Lord of your life. I pray that this has encouraged you, that this has been a good Bible study for you, and maybe you've seen a different way to, to begin to, to study at a deeper level. I pray that you're blessed. Have a great and godly day.